Thank you, President Paxson, thank you. Reverend Chaplain uh, Cooper Nelson, class of 2014. Family, yes, you can go ahead, come on. <laughs> Families, friends, and trees of Brown University. I've invited trees to this ceremony because I believe that trees are appropriate guests to a ceremony that celebrates the seeking of knowledge and truth. In Old English, the root word for the word tree was troth, which is the same root word for the word truth. Both of these entities are rooted in the earth with a strong trunk, and they hold aloft something that sweeps the sky. Trees occupy the physical space between earth and sky with diverse shapes as they trace their paths upward. Lombardi poplars, for example, shoot straight up. Southern live oak trees' branches grow outward instead of upward. And California redwood branches can actually connect with themselves, forming meandering loops in their own crowns. I think you seniors are young trees who are about to enter the metaphorical space between earth and sky. The earth was your parental home. The strong trunk is what you learned here at Brown University. And the sky, well, the sky, I think, is the essence of what you dream about to contribute to the world. And like trees, your paths will take diverse shapes. In my talk this afternoon, I'd like to explore this interesting space between earth and sky. First, I'll reflect on how I navigated this space in the 38 years since my own graduation in this church, actually in seat number 48 right there. Um, second, I'll propose some new models for the journeys that, you, that might lie ahead for you. And finally, we together will set a new precedent in collectively communicating our dreams to the world. So my journey between earth and sky. My earth was my wildly mixed up family in Bethesda, Maryland. My dad grew up in a small village in India. He was a Hindu. He emigrated to study pharmacology and he had a very reserved nature. My mother grew up in Brooklyn, New York. She was of Russian parentage. She was an Orthodox Jew. She studied languages and she was a demonstrative extrovert. I was a third of five children in this loving but chaotic family where curried bagels were our favorite dinner and where on our family shrine we had the Hindu god Ganesha right next to the menorah all sitting on a shelf that stored our Christmas ornaments. As a child, maple trees in the front yard of our home was my refuge from the world of chores, of tussles with siblings, and of strict parental directives. In my, in my imagination, the strong limbs of those trees were a sanctuary for injured birds. They were a safe place for Anne Frank. Trees were my protectors, which led to my lifelong sky dream, which was, number one, to understand trees, and secondly, to protect trees. Brown University was my connecting trunk between earth and sky. Under uh, Brown University's new curriculum, now the open curriculum, I explored diverse disciplines, religious studies, German, nature drawing, and modern dance with Julie Strandberg, which I just loved. <laughs> Julie. What I learned was that each discipline, each way of knowing has specific tools, but all of these disciplines explore and communicate ideas, and all of them inspire actions. Well, biology was the most obvious route to understand trees. My freshman year, the new science library was opened. It was 14, isn't it a new library still? It was 14 stories tall, it was made of concrete, it was all right angles, and it was really actually not very inviting. But I knew, <laughs> does this still go on? I knew that I had to make it my home because I would be studying there. I knew I needed to make it comfortable. I needed to make it my own. So one night I, I decided to spend the whole night inside. I hid out in the bathroom until it was closed, and then I journeyed the entire library, starting on the first floor, dipping into journals, getting a sense of science from astronomy to zoology, floor by floor. Dawn was breaking when I finally arrived at the top, and at that moment I pledged that I would contribute to science, to knowledge, and to truth. My sophomore year, I discovered the field of ecology, 
the study of organisms and their environment from Professor Jonathan Wagi. His quiet but passionate pursuit to understand, dam to understand damselflies and their streamside habitats inspired me to pursue ecology, and he pointed me the pathway. Biology degree, graduate student, postdoc, and finally, an academic position where I could teach, carry out research, write scientific papers, and guide other students along the same path. So I began as a graduate student in forest ecology on my very first trip to Costa Rica. I looked up into the canopy, glimpsing the rich panoply of life aloft. Birds, orchids, monkeys, just 100 feet above my head. But the canopy then was almost totally unknown, unexplored, due to the difficulties of access, a safe access to it. Learning from the few canopy researchers there, I mastered rope, uh, rope climbing techniques to get aloft and later used walkways, construction cranes, and hot air balloons to study arboreal biota. If I could bring you in seat number 48 to the canopy, we would encounter a very different world than the forest floor. It's more open, more wind, more light, and you would see um, animal, plant and animal species that you would never encounter on the forest floor. Lizards with prehensile tails, uh, orchids that bloom for a single day in their whole life, nocturnal anteaters. Um, and I discovered in my studies over the last 30 years that canopy plants perform critical ecological, or they have critical ecological values for the forest. They intercept nutrients and water from rain, they provide food and nesting materials for a diverse array of birds and bats and bees. And so canopy biota play keystone roles in rainforests. I also discovered early on my husband in the canopy. <laughs> Jack was studying ants. We were graduate students. He classifies and names new species. We met as graduate students, and he asked me to teach him to climb trees with this line. Listen to this. I'd like to know if there are ants in the canopy. I mean, what girl could resist that line? <laughs> so, after 30 years of marriage, we've had two wonderful children, August and Erica, and um, life, uh, Jack has named an ant species after each of us, so life is pretty darn good. <laughs> but in the 1990s, the effects of humans on tropical forests we're creating intractable problems. Deforestation, forest fragmentation, loss of biodiversity. My own research so showed that bio canopy biota are very vulnerable to the changes predicted in the future due to climate change. One day, I remember when I was collecting mosses in the canopy, I heard the sound of a chainsaw just outside of my study site. And this, this very small but powerful event precipitated a profound change in the direction of my path between Earth and sky. I saw that although scientific papers I wrote helped to fill the first part of my sky dream to understand trees, it did not, or it failed to directly fulfill the second part of my sky dream, which was to protect trees. And so in those days, I was feeling the despair of trying to solve immovable problems with inadequate tools. The Bengali poet, Vijaya Mukhopadhyay echoed that despair in her poem, Wanting to Move. The speaker in her poem is actually a tree that wishes to move despite its rooted immobility. Wanting to move. Continually, a bell rings in my heart. I was supposed to go somewhere, to some other place. Will you take me with you on your horses down the river with your flames of your torches? They burst out laughing. <laughs> a tree wanting to move from place to place? A tree wanting to move? Startled, I looked at myself. A tree wanting to move? Am I born here then to die here? Even die here? Who rings the bell then inside my heart? Who tells me to go then inside my heart? Who agitates me continually inside my heart. I think Vijaya is asking us, how does a tree, how does a scientist, how does a graduating senior 
at Brown University respond to that agitation inside the heart? I responded by recalling what I had learned at Brown years ago, that each discipline, each way of knowing has specific tools, but all of them can commu communicate ideas and, um, and inspire actions. So I decided to connect the ecological values of trees with the values of other parts of society, both within and outside of academia, that might inspire people to better protect trees and nature. I started with religion and art and social justice. Actually, it was quite easy to link ecological values with religious values. Trees are spiritual symbols that, like my own family, transcend religious borders. I mean, just look at this church, look at these columns. Their form mimics that of trees that bring our eyes and our spirits toward the heavens. The Old Testament describes the tree of knowledge and the tree of life. Buddha found enlightenment underneath the bow tree. The Hindu poet Rabindranath Tagore wrote, trees are the earth's endless efforts to speak to the listening heavens. Jews celebrate the gifts of trees during, during the holiday of Tub Shabbat. That's a surprise. Okay, a little more serious stuff and then we'll get into something fun. Herman Hesse articulated a profoundly spiritual statement. Whoever has learned how to listen to trees no longer wants to become a tree. He wants to be nothing except what he is. That is home and that is happiness. So my uh, way of linking these two was to systematically search the holy texts of the world's religion, the, Bar the Bible, the Quran, the Talmud, the Gita, and find all the verses on trees and forests. And I integrated these hundreds of references into a, a sermon called Trees and Spirituality, which I offered to give to churches, to synagogues, and to temples. It was actually the Unitarians who first invited this Hindu Jewish scientist to the pulpit um, and since then, I've spoken in dozens of places of worship, finding in all faiths the common ground rooted in their own scriptures that trees are of deep value to humans and must be protected. It was also easy to connect ecological values to aesthetic values. I staged a set of week-long what I called canopy confluences in remote forests, gathering ecologists, artists, poets, and musicians to climb up into canopy platforms and there create art and poetry and music and moss collections from a canopy perspective. These projects led to, these led to projects that directly inspired conservation. One project, one project actually brought me back and reconnected me to modern dance. On one of our confluences, choreographer Jody Lomas created a dance about rainforests called Biome. Our performances included my delivery of a scientific talk about the diversity and fragility of forests. Jody performed her dance. And in the lobby, local conservation groups offered volunteer opportunities to plant and protect trees. Other conservation projects resulted as well. I hired rap singers to engage at-risk youth to make hip-hop songs about trees in urban parks. We provided tattoo artists with scientific facts about trees, which they could convey to clients who choose to get tree tattoos. We are now seeking fashion designers to create clothes made from fabric printed with botanically correct plant images, accompanied by hang tags with information on that plant's conservation. So the wearer of these clothes then can inspire others simply by walking down the street. We also wanted to link the values of nature to those who live totally without it. For instance, the 2.3 million incarcerated men and women in the United States. In 2004, partnering with the Washington State Department of Corrections, I started a science lecture series in a state prison, which led to gardening and composting and beekeeping behind bars. We also taught the inmates how to rear endangered frogs and butterflies and rare prairie plants for ecological restoration projects. To me, this shows that everyone, everyone can participate in the care of our earth. This sustainability in prisons project now exists in prisons and jails in nine states, saving money, saving species, and maybe in some ways saving lives. So the ecological values of trees, I believe, can be linked with the seemingly strange bedfellows of preachers and poets and prisoners. 
And looking back on the four decades since I left Brown, I realized that this neat pathway between Earth and sky that I had laid out at Brown didn't really predict my pursuits. So I have generated a new model, which is called the meatball model of life. And here's how it goes. For some, the journey between Earth and sky is a straight pathway from A to B. But for others, life is a giant pot of spaghetti sauce with meatballs, vegan meatballs, of course, floating around slowly in this matrix of hot sauce. As a graduating senior, you are sitting on meatball A. The opportunity of meatball B passes by, might be a job, a new boyfriend, and you can choose whether or not to stay on meatball A or jump to meatball B until meatball C passes by. Another job, another boyfriend. Again, you have a choice to go on and on until ultimately you end up on meatball Z, which is kind of where I am right now. Most meatballs are very positive, but dark parts exist in the sauce of any life. We may experience loss of a job, suicide of an older sister, the anguish of a son or daughter who's facing a crisis of confidence that we cannot allay with parental advice. We may find ourselves in the dark vortex of an addiction that spirals us to the bottom of the pot until we find the courage to accept ourselves and accept the help of those around us so that we may once more move again skyward towards our dream. I have to say I'm quite happy with my meatballs, but I have to also say that I haven't been always confident of my choices. My decisions to interact with tattoo artists and with prisoners were, did not really fit the linear path of most academics. In fact, when I got that letter of invitation from President Paxson, I was pretty sure she had misaddressed it because I thought that Brown University would most value those who followed the direct paths between earth and sky. It's doctors, it's lawyers, it's businessy people. But standing at this, standing at this honored pulpit, I see today that as a brown, brown woman, a Hindu Jewish, a Jewish daughter of two immigrant parents and an academic who has opted for a meatball existence, I believe I do have a place here at Brown's youth celebration of its 250th birthday. What can I offer as advice? I think I can say that no, if the straight path between earth and sky for you is not appropriate, that's fine. Embrace alternatives. Be truly open to other disciplines and other ways of life, even the goofy ones. In fact, especially the goofy ones. And finally, when someone on Meatball Z offers you advice, realize it may be irrelevant because <laughs> all meatballs have been moving around and since she was on Meatball A. In other words, choose your own meatballs. <laughs> but now it is time to move to spotlight your own sky dream, the essence of an action that will help our world. For example, you might, your dream might be something like, I want to bring health care to rural areas. I want to raise a child that is healthy in, in mind and spirit. I want to know myself. Take a moment to articulate your sky dream to yourself. Got it? A critical first step in actually realizing this dream is sharing it with others. And so I am going to invite you to describe your own sky dream to your classmates and with the world right now. For the first time in the 250 year history of Brown University, the class of 2014 is going to stage a Brown Flash tweet on Twitter. <laughs> Those of you listening on the green or in sales hall, please join us. We have two minutes to do this. So first, please stand up and turn your cell phones on. <laughs> OK. What? Oh, yeah, yeah. What I'd like you to do next and you'll need to listen to me because I know there's a lot of hubbub, but we, wanna, we are timed on this. I would like you to 
express that sky dream you had in your head just a minute ago and tweet it out to hashtag Brown2014. And you can see the ushers here are holding up the tweet for that. If you don't have a phone or if you don't use Twitter, you can still participate. Find someone else who doesn't have a phone and doesn't Twitter and verbally state what your sky dream is in quiet tones. <laughs> when you're done, please sit down and turn off your phones. Please share your sky dreams with somebody else. Could you please sit down? If you're not done yet, you can tweet in at any time. Please sit down. If you're not done tweeting, you can do this at any time. You ready? Your contributions to this flash treat will create a snapshot of the collective dreams that the class of 2014 holds to make the world a better place. You might accomplish this by a straight path or by meatball moves or some other model that you come up with that suits you. We can all visit this, this site and view the rich and diverse dreams that you are posing for your own lives and for the planet. We will watch for the emerging truths, the troughs, as you draw upon your deep roots, your strong trunk, and create something that sweeps the sky. In closing, just before we hear the taiko drums bring our sky dreams into the heavens, I invite you to do three things. First, I invite you to recognize and honor the guidance that you have received in the earth of your parental homes and here at Brown University. Second, be mindful of all that the trees that we invited here this afternoon and the rest of nature provide us. And third, get ready to jump on your next meatball as you grow from earth to sky, you awesome class of 2014. Thank you.